The book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1 is where we begin. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 1. These be the words which Moses spoke to all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain opposite the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dizahab. So the book of Deuteronomy is basically Moses' last message to God's people before they enter into the promised land. Verse 2. There are 11 days journey from Horeb, that's Mount Sinai, by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. Um, 11 days journey. Took them 40 years because they were under God's judgment wandering in the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in the wilderness. Verse 3. And it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them. So he is going to talk about the law of God. The law of God was given in a written way. Moses is going to now speak about it orally. Verse 4, after he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, which dwelt at Ashtaroth in Andredi. And those two kings made war against Israel, and uh, that was a deadly mistake on their behalf because God protected his people and defeated them. Five, on this side, Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law, saying, now, they're not in the promised land. This is before they crossed the Jordan River. Moses will not be going in, and we're going to find out why a little later on here. But uh, he's giving this final speech, this final sermon, before they cross into the land. Six. History lesson. The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, Mount Sinai, saying, you have dwelled long enough in this mount. It's time to break camp. Time to head toward the promised land. Seven, turn you. Take your journey and go to the mount of the Amorites and to all the places near there too, in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, and in the south, and by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, and to Lebanon, to the great river, the river Euphrates. And so he's saying, head toward the promised land. Eight, behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them and to their seed after them. There's the promise from God. That land is set before them like you set a meal before a guest. The table is set, the meal is on the table, and you say to your guest, start eating. And that's in essence what God is saying. Go to the promised land and take what I have given you. Nine, and I spoke to you at that time saying, I'm not able to bear you myself alone. It was a tough job. Moses really was having a hard time carrying all the responsibility of leading, you know, probably two million Israelites all by himself, settling disputes and, and uh, just being a leader in general and putting up with their complaints. Ten, the Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude, which is what he promised to Abraham, he said, I'm going to multiply your children, your offspring, as the stars of heaven. 11. The Lord God of your fathers 
make you a thousand times so many more as you are and bless you as he has promised you. <clears throat> Moses, Moses prays that God will bless him even more. Nothing wrong with having a large population as long as you're walking with the Lord. Then it's a sign of his blessing and he will provide too. 12. How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? I just can't handle all this stuff. You've got, he said at the time, he, Moses said, you, you guys have too many problems and you're always bickering. And it was just too big of a job for one man, even Moses. 13. Take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. And so that's what God told Moses, that he was going to give him some helpers. 14. And you answered me and said, The thing which you have spoken is good for us to do. They saw the wisdom in it. 15. So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men, and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, captains over fifties, captains over tens, and officers among your tribes. Basically, he set up a form of government, which began at the local level. We would say local government, county government, state government, and federal government. <clears throat> Delegated the authority, so he wouldn't have to handle everything himself. 16, and I charged your judges at that time, saying, Here are the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is with them. And so those at the lowest level of government were to be men who knew the word of God so that they could judge disputes based on Scripture and be led by God. And this way God would be in charge. Verse 17, you shall not respect persons in judgment, but you shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's, and the cause that is too hard for you bring to me, and I will hear it. And so Moses made it clear to those rulers under him that they were to judge according to the word of God and not be intimidated by anyone, and don't show any favorites either. And if you can't handle something, if it's just, if it's got you puzzled, just... Send it to me, and I'll take care of it. 18. And I commanded you at that time all the things which you should do. And, of course, Moses got his commands for the people from God. 19. And when we departed from Horeb, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness, which you saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. So God was leading them through the wilderness, but he was providing along the way. 20. And I said to you, you are come to the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God does give to us. Moses reminded them when they got to the border of the promised land way back then, 40 years earlier. God gave you this land. We've arrived. He's promised to give that to us. 21. Behold, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of your fathers has said to you. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by the inhabitants of the land. Just remember the word of God and obey him. Keep your eyes on Almighty God, not on the challenges, and he'll get you through. That's basically what God told them to do, and that's what they should have done. 22, and you came near to me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land and bring, word, bring us word again by what way we must go up and into what cities we shall come. And there wasn't anything wrong with sending spies to check out the land, to see which way would be the best way to enter. There, there was nothing wrong with that. That's just uh, using God-given common sense and being, and being wise. 23, and God does lead through those things. 
23, and the saying pleased me well. And I took 12 men of you, one of a tribe. And they turned and went up into the mountain and came to the valley of Eshkol and searched it out. So one man from every one of the 12 tribes of Israel was sent in to spy out the land. They checked it all out. 25. It says, And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God does give us. Well, God had told them that it was going to be good. It was going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. And they went in there. And sure enough, God knew what he was talking about. God God fulfilled his promise. That's exactly what the land was like. 26, notwithstanding, Moses says, you would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. You disobeyed God. He wanted to give you this land, and you refused to go in. <clears throat> 27, and you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he has brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. They were intimidated by the size of the inhabitants of the promised land. And then they blasphemed God. God brought us out of Egypt because he hated us. Oh, really? How quickly they forgot how miserable they were in Egypt and how they cried out to the Lord for deliverance and he delivered them. Not because he hated them, but because he loved them. And he, caught, he, he was so faithful to them through their journeys in the wilderness, providing for them, protecting them, because he loved them. He brought them to the border of the promised land because he loved them. He said, I'll give you this land because he loved them. And they get to the border, and instead of remembering God's faithfulness and his great character, <clears throat> they look at the circumstances and they accuse God of being a hater. 28. Where shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. There were giants in the land. Evidently, evidently, some more fallen angels cohabitated with human women and created a, another half-breed race as it was in the days of Noah. It was the same, same people. The giants were in the land. And I don't know what other explanation there could possibly be for that because the original group was destroyed in the flood. But anyway, they're looking at these giants and they say, we can't take him. Yeah, but they forgot that God was so much bigger than their adversaries. See, they got the wrong focus. 29. Then I said to you, dread not, neither be afraid of them. Moses tried to talk some sense into them. What are you afraid for? God has proven himself so many times. How can you possibly be afraid of any challenge that lies before you? I don't care how big they are. When Moses says as much, 30, The Lord your God, which goes before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. He's proven that he can do it, and he's proven that he is willing to do it, and no one can stop him. He defeated the world's superpower, Egypt, by his own might. On behalf of his people. So what makes them think that he's not going to do it now since he promised to do it? It's the same God. It's the same word of God. 31. And in the wilderness, where you have seen how the Lord your God bore you as a man does bear his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place, he has taken care of you every step of the way. And you say he's brought you out here to kill you? <clears throat> 32, yet in this thing you did not believe the Lord your God. See, <clears throat> it wasn't that they didn't believe Moses. They didn't believe God because all Moses did was speak the word of God. Don't be offended 
when someone doesn't believe you if you're proclaiming the Word of God. I don't like being rejected because I preach the Word of God and I teach it clearly. I don't like being rejected. Oh, I have been many, many times. But I have to keep in mind, that's their problem. And it's not even between me and them. It's between them and God. Because all I'm doing is proclaiming the Word of God. 33. <clears throat> Who went in the way before you, he's talking about God, to search you out a place to pitch your tents in, in fire by night and to show you by way you should go and in a cloud by day. He directed their steps every inch of the way through that wilderness and, and, and he brought them to the place where they are at. He's been in control. What makes them think that he's going to lose control when they cross the border? Doesn't even make sense. 34, and the Lord heard the voice of your words and was angry and swore, saying, God was angry. He heard the Israelites blaspheme him, disregard all of his goodness, his track record. This is what God said, 35, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swore to give to their fathers. You don't want to go in? Fine. You're not going in. 36. Save Caleb, the son of Jephuna. He shall see it. And to him will I give the land that he has trodden upon and to his children, because he has wholly followed the Lord. Caleb was one of the spies that went into the promised land with the other 11. And he tried to calm the people down. The other 11 spies brought back an evil report, and we can't do it. <clears throat> I don't care what God says, we can't do it. Caleb, Caleb says, no, we can do it. You've got to believe the Lord. And God noticed that. <clears throat> God knows who his people are and who are not his people. And he makes a difference. He makes the distinction. So he said, you guys aren't getting in. None of you adult generation that came out of Egypt is going to make it into the promised land, but Caleb will eventually. 37, also the Lord was angry with me for your sakes, saying, you also shall not go in there. Not even Moses could go in. <sighs> Moses, Moses, Moses. He let the people of Israel get to him. And he lost his temper. And he dishonored God in front of the people. And for that, God said, you're not getting in. I'm telling you, we better tread carefully before the Lord God Almighty because he means business. And yes, he loves us. And don't, don't worry, Moses went to heaven, but he was judged here on earth because of his disobedience. Don't kid yourself. You disobey God. I don't care if you're a child of God or not. He's going to judge you. You're going you're gonna to find trouble. 38. But Joshua, the son of Nun which stands before you, he shall go in there, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. And so Joshua would be Moses' successor. He would lead them into the promised land. And Moses, being the humble guy that he was, didn't hold it against Joshua. He encouraged him, even though Moses himself would not go in. Joshua was Moses' replacement, but Moses was smart enough to know that God replaced him for a good reason because of his sin. He had every right to do it. 39, moreover, your little ones, which you said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in there, and to them will I give it, and they shall possess it. God won't hold the parents' sin against the children. They're going into the promised land when they grow up, and it would be a while. 40, but as for you, turn you, take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Turn around and march. Go right back where you came from. Get back into the wilderness. 41, then you answered and said to me, we have sinned 
against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. And when you had girded on every man his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the hill. They changed their mind. When they found out that they really angered God and that he pronounced judgment on them, that they wouldn't go into the promised land, that they had to turn around and go into the wilderness, they all cried out and said, Oh, we changed our mind. We'll go in. We'll go in. 42. And the Lord said to me, Say to them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest you be smitten before your enemies. Don't try it now. When I told you to go in, you wouldn't go in, so don't try it now, because I'm not going in with you. 43. Moses says, So I spoke to you, and you would not hear. Well, what is new about that, huh? But rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and went presumptuously up into the hill. What's the difference between presumption and faith? To live by faith, you need a word from God. Faith is not a leap in the dark. It is not doing something on a whim and saying, this is faith. It's not doing something stupid, reckless, and saying, I'm doing it by faith. It's not it. When you see something in the written word of God and you obey it, or in the case of the Israelites, when God spoke to them through Moses, they had a word from God. And if they would have, if they would have, if they would have obeyed the word from God and gone into the land, they would have gone in by faith. But God said, don't go in now because I'm not going to be with you because you rebelled one too many times. So they did not have a word from God. And they decided they were going to go in anyway. That's presumption. See, that's the difference between faith and presumption. To live by faith, you have to have a word from God. Otherwise, it's just presumption. You're putting God to the test, as it were. 44, and the Amorites, which dwelled in that mountain, came out against you, chased you as bees do, and destroyed you in Seir, even to Hormah, made fools out of you. Because God was not with you. Apart from God, we can do nothing. The Bible says, you better be walking with him. Or are you going to make a mess out of your life? 45, and you returned and wept before the Lord. But the Lord would not hearken to your voice, nor give ear to you. God didn't pay any attention to their tears. Judgment had hit, and it was too late for tears. He didn't feel sorry for them. They got what was coming, and he had been very patient with them. God's patience eventually does run out with people. He pities his people who repent. But if they don't repent, there does come a time where that's it. It's all over. The age of grace is over. 46. So you abode in Kedesh. Many days, according to the days that you abode there. So they just kind of set put. Didn't go anywhere. What they needed to do was get right with God again. Repent of their sins. 